All right, so second Sunday of Advent, I want to share a text that you may not necessarily connect with the Christmas season, but it is an important aspect of what we believe, um, both for this time of the year and for what we hope for one day to be with Jesus. So we're in Second Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 15. <clears throat> And the text says, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about destruction of the heavens by fire, and the, ele the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. So, Lord, we are looking to you. We need your leading and your direction in our hearts and our lives. As we prayed earlier, we need your leading and direction in the, this nation in which we live, this world in which we live on. You are in control and you are leading. You are steering. You are our Lord, our God, our Savior, our King. You are everything to us. You are the all-sufficient one, Lord. Help us to remember that as we walk through the days that we experience, I pray in Christ's name. Amen. And amen. You know, I have, I have read recently in a couple of different places and different periodicals concerns that some theologians are raising one particular one raised it as sort of an alarm that we are at a place now where even among evangelicals there is less and less of an emphasis on the second coming and one day going to be with the Lord because the focus has turned to how we live here and, and not that we go there. So the emphasis of the second coming is diminishing. There are some among evangelicals, I don't know who, I just saw it, read this in the article. There are some among evangelicals that no longer believe in the concept of the rapture, the catching up of the saints. But as a church, we still do. And as important as it is for us to believe in the first advent, the first arrival, the first coming of our Messiah, who came as a baby, grew up among men, and, and taught and preached and ministered, and then died on a cross for you and me. So there is a second advent, the coming of the Lord, not as a baby, but as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And right now, you and I are living in the in-between. We've already seen and we have the history and we know the story of the advent and we're looking for the second one. Today is the second Sunday of Christmas, the second Sunday of Advent. And Christmas time is important to really focus on not just the glitter and the comfort and the joy as I said last week, those are great distractions, especially in times of distress. And I encouraged us as a church 
not to be afraid to be a little distracted in times of distress. So put your decorations up and play the Christmas music and bake those cookies and bring me some. Just kidding. But let our distractions not distract us from the truth. Amen. Because, because we, are, we are celebrating and we are remembering the birth of a Savior. And we are looking forward to the return of the King. And in between that, Jesus made a promise to us. And that is that he would give us peace. So the focus of today's Advent, second Sunday of Christmas, is peace. And we get that out of this text, Second Peter. When he writes to the church and encourages them to be at peace. Those who have uncertainties in their faith and unsure about what's going on and always get scared and full of anxiety about the end of the world and the second coming and what's that going to be like. And they can look at Second Peter and see it as a message of fear. But if you and I as believers, we read texts like 2 Peter, it ought not to bring a rise to the level of our hearts to the surface fear. It ought, to, it ought to bring to the surface peace, assurance. There ought to be a certain comfort that rises and says, my Lord is with me and he's coming back for me and I'm not letting go of that. Fear is not what Peter had in mind. Fear is not what Jesus, we talked about the end times, that's not what he had in mind for the believers. And as Peter wraps up this text, Paul did not have that in mind. You and I live in precarious times. We look at pandemics and we look at the fear and anxiety around the world and we have to ask ourselves, do we get on the wave of that and ride the wave of fear and anxiety and being scared? Or do we rise up and say, these are just more evidence of the last days. And while we recognize it and while we have to take precautions and while we, we have to follow directions for the human side of who we are, quarantine, get tested, wear a mask. We also need to understand who's really in control of our life. And it's not our government. They lead a nation. But God's in control of our life. And God leads eternity. And I'm living for eternity. So I'm following the one who's leading me into eternity. And I hope you are too. This is a text that... Peter writes to remind the church of where things are because they are at the time of Peter's writing that people are beginning to start questioning is Jesus Christ really coming back that's why I opened with that there is a discussion going on within the church within evangelicals about the return of Christ and whether it's true or not because in Peter's day they were beginning to wonder is this real is Jesus really coming back? It's been, it's been 40 years, 50 years. Is, is he coming back? We thought it was going to be like tomorrow. We thought it was going to be like in a few days. And Peter begins this with saying, listen, church, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. But well, you're, you're trying to compare eternity with, with the earth. You're trying to compare heaven and earth. You're trying, to pay, you're trying to compare eternal time and chronological time, and you can't do it because they aren't the same. Because in chronological time, you're going to have a 24-hour day, but in eternity, that could be a 1,000 years. Or one day in eternity could be like 1,000 years on the earth. They don't match up. People are beginning to wonder, God, are you... Are you going to return? They see the slowness of God as maybe we missed it. Maybe maybe we shouldn't be looking at this. Maybe, and, and maybe this isn't true. And, and so they're starting to ask themselves, well, what should we do? If, if Jesus is not coming back, then how are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to survive this? 
governments are coming up against us, the religions of the world, uh, the religions of our day, they're attacking us. How, 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 how do we live? It's no different from them than it is for us. This text should remind us that even though our toils, our struggles seem endless on this earth, we have to remember, just like Peter reminds the church when he writes this letter, we have to remember that God sees a bigger picture than we can see. That God is in control of the circumstances of their generation. God is in control of the circumstances of our generation. God is in control. The text in here speaks about God keeping his promise and the Lord coming like a thief and that talks about a fire that will that will come and says the heavens will with the about the the day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. Now that's verse twelve. Verse thirteen says, "But in keeping with His promise, we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth." So these things will happen. These things will be, but. But you see judgment, Peter, Peter writes, but what's actually taking place is refinement. It is like a refiner's fire that is refining and purifying in, in, in a process that a, a subject to perfecting and purifying, just as Jesus taught, for example, you have the wheat and the chaff. And Jesus says, there's coming a day when, when I will separate the wheat from the chaff. Now, uh, you, we, we still know we're, we're a little farther removed from farming than our, our parents and grandparents were. But we still know the difference between wheat and chaff. We've read the Bible enough to understand that the wheat is the, the germ, the wheat germ that gets processed for the bread that we eat. And the chaff is stuff that comes off of that. It's the, it's the waste that we have nothing to do with it. It goes back down, it goes back to the dust. And, Peter, and Jesus gives this whole, this whole picture of, listen, the chaff, that's bad. It's worthless and that's getting burned up. But the wheat, oh, the wheat is good and it remains. So too, God will deal with the world. That which is not of him will be burned. It shall melt. It should be destroyed like the chaff. Or like gold being heated and refined. Why is gold heated and why is it melted in a refiner's fire? It is melted so that as it melts, all the impurities in that, in that precious metal can rise to the surface. And as it rises to the surface, the, 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 the guys who are doing this can scrape that off. And as they scrape that off, the gold becomes more pure. And so as they allow it to be molten, and as they allow it to be liquid and keep it heated, they watch for those impurities to rise and just skim it off. It's like when you're cooking, you know, you're like, yes, last night I was making a gravy. And as I was making that gravy, there were, there were impurities that were rising. There were things, stuff that was still coming out like a residue coming out from that flour. And as it, as it rose, it bubbled up over the top of that gravy. And as that gravy cooled, it could take that and just skim it right off like a, like a crusty top could come right off and, and it was gone. And oh, Jeanette will tell you that gravy was some of the best gravy we had in a while. That was some good gravy. Um, but it was so good because we allow the impurities or the, that which should not be part of that recipe to come to the top and remove. And a refiner's fire is where God says, I'm going to heat things up. And that which is not of me shall be removed. And that which is of me shall come and be with me for eternity. 
So you see, for the non-believer, a text like 2 Peter 3 can scare them to death. But for the believer, a text like 2 Peter chapter 3, it, it ought to encourage us and charge us and, and give us hope it can, and give us peace in our heart because it's saying, yes, Jesus is coming back. You see, we have hope when God is in control. The Bible says when Jesus said, when you see these signs and all these things beginning to happen around the world, people turning against each other, nations turning against each other, the earthquakes and diseases and all kinds of changes in the atmosphere and on this earth. And he says, listen, don't be distraught. Don't be taken in by it. Don't be, don't be full of anxiety and fear over this. Be at peace because this is the beginning. These are but birth pains of, of me doing what I said I would do. They, they, are, they are the advent of the return of Jesus Christ. The return of the king. The painful and the sinful places of the world will be removed while what is good remains. Church, if we are followers of Christ, we are the good that remains. We are the good that remains. <clears throat> the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, which literally means the elements will be refined by fire. The, the, the word destroyed is in there, but really going back to the original language, it should be more interpreted. You know, NIV uses destroy for some reason, but literally it means to be refined by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. It's a, it's a great opportunity where God says, I'm, I'm getting rid of the chaff. And let my, let my people rise. So, peace. Peace instead of fear. The text is a text of promise and hope and peace. The heart of this text is, like I said in my opening, it is, and you hope you can follow me on this, it is the already and not yet kingdom of God see Christ brought the kingdom of God to earth through the incarnation that day when Jesus Christ was born the day of the Lord was realized when Jesus began to minister what happened the promises that were said from the ages on before the blind saw freedom was declared for the captive the lame walked the lepers were healed justice peace hope and love were preached. Remember what Jesus said when one of John's followers came and said, John's in prison that they knew. John wants to know, are you the one or should we be looking for another? You know, another one of those questions, a little different than Second Peter, but yet it's one of those questions where we thought that we thought you were it, and now we're not so sure. And what does Jesus say? And it's found in Matthew chapter 4, verse uh, chapter 11 verses 4 through 6 the deaf hear the blind see and the good news is preached to the poor that was all john needed to go to his death he knew that death was waiting for him because as he sat in prison and that's all he needed he could go to his grave knowing that the, the Messiah that they were looking for, the Messiah that they were longing for, the promises the prophets prophesied about is there in their midst because the deaf hear, the blind see, the good news is preached to the poor. The kingdom of God is not fully realized. It's not fully in place. It, it has not, it has not, actualized until Christ's return. The incarnation was the beginning. There is still the return of, the, of the, the king. But in between the baby and the king, there is still sin. 
and disorder in this world. Would you agree? Amen. We still see many in need of healing from disease. We pray for people who were sick this morning. COVID-19 COVID is just another in a round or in a, in, a, in a string of diseases that hit the human race. We still need healing from disease. We still see high rates of slavery. People are enslaved all over this world. More than you can even imagine. The wrongful imprisonment all over this globe. We still see acts of injustice, racism, anger, bitterness, revenge, war, hatred, rules from nation to nation, from people group to people group. You and I, as those who believe in the baby, who believe in the Savior, who came and lived and died and rose again on the third day, we live in this great in-between time. We celebrate the birth of Christ while waiting his final return. We don't know the day or the hour of Christ's return. So we must live as people who are always ready. Just like the people of Peter's day began to wonder, is he coming or not? And if he's not coming, then how are we supposed to live? And that was one of the questions they were asking Peter. How do we live for Jesus? Waiting for his return. Well, church, how do we live for Jesus? Waiting for his return. It's a good question. I'm glad you guys asked that. You guys ask good questions. There's a great example in the story of Stephen in Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. There are long chapters. Chapter 7 is more than 60 verses. So obviously I'm not going to read those two chapters. But you can look them up in your Bible. Acts chapter 6 and Acts chapter 7. Stephen is, a, is what we know as the first deacon. This is interesting when you read those, those two chapters and you read a little bit more insight of Stephen. Stephen. Stephen, as a deacon, was a man who was full of the Holy Spirit. This is why we talk about deacons needing to be filled with the Spirit or wanting to be, desiring to be filled with the Spirit. Because our deacons need to be anointed not just by a man at an altar. Deacons need to be anointed by the Holy Spirit. Stephen was anointed of the Holy Spirit. He was filled with the Spirit. And it says in those, in those two chapters, when you read about Stephen, it says that he walked and he ministered. Miracles followed his ministry. People were healed in his ministry as a deacon. You know, sometimes we have a, this attitude that, well, the only time we're going to really see the healing of God and a stirring of God is if we can bring the right evangelist into the church and you know, evangelists come into church to stir them up, stir the church up, get the church awake and get back on track and get focused of, of, of the things of God. But yet here's an example where here's a deacon who is not considered a spiritual leader as in one of the apostles. And yet as a, as a deacon, the Holy Spirit anoints him to go and do the very work that the apostles are doing. Are you hearing me? That's good news. You say, well, how shall I live? You walk in the, in the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's how we live. We walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. We walk in the mercy and grace of Almighty God. Because that's what Stephen did. Stephen had such a heart for God that even when he is being put to death, he, is, he has nothing but mercy and grace and, and compassion for his killers. We get mad and want to start a war when someone puts 10 leaves on our lawn in the fall. Or we're shoveling the snow and our neighbor, our neighbor pushes the snow and it's sitting in the middle of our driveway and say, how dare he do that? I'm going to go get even. I'm going to go send 10 dogs and go over and mess up his front lawn. I mean, it's amazing what we can do to be, sometimes we, we just let our anger get the best of us. And sometimes we let our attitudes get way out of whack. And boy, we do more harm than good, don't we? We just, we just let, we let the world get under our skin. 
we let politicians get under our skin. Boy, didn't that show up this year. We let our neighbors get under our skin. We let our bosses get under our skin. We let family members get under our skin. It's like, oh, how dare you? But I just want to remind you that in, in Acts chapter 6 and 7, here is a young man full of the Spirit serving God. And, and, and the, the religious elite of that day, they went and lied about Stephen and they brought trumped up charges. And I'm not the word trump, but, you know, made up charges against Stephen. They lied about him in order to get him arrested. And when you follow through, it, it should amaze you to read the sermon that Stephen preached to his captors, to those who had him arrested and he was brought before them in, in, in what we would nickname today like a kangaroo court. The end was already decided. So why have the, why have the hearing? But they have the hearing. And, and Stephen preaches an amazing sermon, taking them all the way back from Abraham, through Moses, through the prophets, to Jesus. And when he gets to Jesus and he said, y'all killed him. And when he, when he mentions Jesus and that Jesus was the one, they cover their ears and they scream at the top of their lungs. They gnash their teeth and then they take him out and they begin to stone him. And in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, as Stephen is falling to his knees, he cries out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. What did Jesus say when he hung on a cross? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. They know not what they do. We say, how do, how do we live in a world like this? How do we live in cr the craziness that has become our society? We think, well, it's become the new norm. It's like, what am I supposed to do with this? Peter says, I'll tell you what you do in a world that's gone mad. When you come to a place when you wish Jesus would come yesterday, you don't know if he's coming tomorrow. You don't know what to do. Jesus says, Peter says, you got to be at peace. You've got to live in peace. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, this return of Christ, make everything every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace. Think about that. Three directives. Be spotless, be blameless, and be at peace. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation. You know, you and I can be at peace even in the storms that are raging in our world. In John 14, 27, Jesus said, and, and I, I love this text, and you know you've heard me quote this so many times, and it bears repeating today, where Jesus says, my peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world says, if you keep reading that, give I to you. Jesus offers us a peace the world can't give. What kind of peace does the world offer? Well, what kind of peace treaties are we still trying to sign? We still send emissaries over to Israel, trying to get Israel's and the Palestinians to sign a peace deal. We just had Israel have a peace deal with the, the, the Emirates and, the, and a few other places over there. It's like, oh, wow, that's major. It's a major accomplishment. The Bible says when, people, when men yell peace, sudden destruction is looming on the horizon. So those peace deals, don't, they don't last. You know, we have a, a, a peaceful transfer of power. You know, all through an election, the, the people who, who run against each other, they can't say enough dirt and nastiness about each other. And then most of the time after an election is over, they sit down and they say, oh, you know, I, I, I really respect this person. He ran a good, hard race and bless the Lord, we're going to go on. And he's a good man. She's a good woman. It's like, I wish they would do that again because we're getting less and less of that civility in our, in our country. But peace, peace in this world 
it's nothing more than a, a, than a temporary band-aid on an injury that won't heal. Sin is like a, that injury that will not heal. And the only way you can deal with sin in our hearts and lives is the blood of Christ, right? The blood of Christ covers our sins. That is that God says, I'll take care of this because there is no healing for your sin. There's redemption. There's forgiveness. But sin is sin. We're all sinners, the Bible says. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And we will continue to because it's our humanity. It's our flesh. But Jesus says, I'm not trying to offer you a peace deal like, like the kings can offer each other. I'm not trying to offer you a peace deal like the north and the south can try to figure out how to do at the end of the Civil War. I'm not trying to come up with a peace deal like it did at the end of World War I or the end of World War World War II, or a peace deal between North and South Vietnam, or a peace deal between Iran or, and us, or Iraq. Because all those wars I just mentioned, those peace deals did not survive. They had time limits because those were human beings trying to facilitate a peace that they did not, in some cases, want. So it does not survive. Jesus says, but I have a peace that I leave with you. And I have a peace that I want to give to you. And it is, it is a wholeness. It is a completeness. The peace that is mentioned here is shalom. I, I, have a, I am offering you the peace of God that makes you whole and complete in his eyes. That even in the midst of a storm of life, you can be at rest knowing that you are in the very hands of Almighty God. Church, you and I live in some pretty interesting times where we can have the peace of God. We can have the peace of God flood our hearts. You know, peace and, and, and dogs and ribbons look great on a Christmas card. But we need that peace of God, not on a card or on a letterhead, we need that peace of God in the depths of our heart. We need his peace. There's a song that they sing, peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from the Father above. Sweep over my spirit forever, I pray, in fathomless billows of love. We need the very peace of God. God wants to bring it the message Christmas declares is peace on earth. Let there be peace on earth. The angels preach a message. Jesus also preached peace during his time on earth. In the Sermon on the Mount, he calls the peacemakers blessed. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, he said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Blessed are those who make peace. How do I live for God in this, in this horrible world, this, this, this upheaval of a, of, of a globe? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. If the message of the first coming is peace, then so is the message of the second coming. Because Jesus Christ will come and he will make everything right and everything whole. Remember that first he calls the church up. Then he brings the church and comes back. And he sets up a rule and reign in Jerusalem. And while he's ruling and reigning, everything's made right. We live and we rule and we reign with him in, in Jerusalem. And, and then all the nations of the world, the Bible says, come during that millennial. They come and pay honor to Jesus and Pay tribute to Jesus, and there's peace on earth. And we know that that happens for a millennial, and then, there, then there's a lifting of that veil one more time for the rest of the world. And then there's however long that lasts. Then there is the finale. There is the end of the end of the end when Jesus meets them out in that valley. And Jesus leads that war. And then every... Every soldier 
of every tribe and every tongue and every nation it will be brought to an end in that valley. And John saw at the end of all that, he saw the heavens and the earth roll up like a scroll. And then he saw a new heavens and a new earth. And it's in that, it is in that place with creation continuing to, to move forward, God's creative handwork, that we rule and reign with Jesus forever and ever and ever. His peace. <clears throat> so you and I, we're living in the in-between. And Peter says, while you're living in the in-between, <coughs> you're going to have peace. And it's interesting that in this concept of peace, this declaration that Peter makes about peace, he joins it with the idea of being blameless, having purity, and lining up with holiness. Those three that I mentioned earlier. So if holiness has victory over sin and death, then it is possible to live a blameless life. How do we live a blameless life? It's possible. To live a life where people don't come and bring, bring ought against you. Peter is saying something about the responses of people of God. The people of God are to work toward living blameless lives which will lead to peace. Blessed are the peacemakers. They are the children of God. That means we become a people who are known for living at peace. We become a people who are known for being honorable and and, and an upright and forthcoming. We are known for people who are honest and truth tellers. We are known that our yes is yes and our no is no. We, we are known for being uh, generous. We are known for being at peace. We are known for being humble. We are not known for being warmongers. We are not known for being racist. We are not known for being prejudiced. We are not known as people who are hateful. We are not known as people who are vindictive. Sadly, there are those in the titles of Christianity who are known for those things that are sin and death. And it's sad. But Peter is saying, listen, the church of God, the people of God, they are to work toward living blameless lives which will lead to peace. Righteousness, also known as justice, doing the right things for the right reasons is part of being a peacemaker. Peace. Loving God and loving others is at the heart of living in peace. This is not a kind of peace that makes you passive. It is, it is a peace that is truly a lesson in being patient. To be a peacemaker is to have a lot of patience. I know somebody can say amen somewhere out there in the TV land. Loving God and loving others. <laughs> it's an art of patience particularly with the others. Just imagine how much patience God has with you and me as he loves us unconditionally. Because if God is patient with his people, then we are also called to be patient and to be long-suffering and to long with God for the redemption of humanity. I have said this so many times that our, the, the heart of God is the loss. We, when, when we wander sometimes, it's been 2,000 years. And so how long is God going to wait? When is he going to just bring us home and look around you? Look around you. How many unsaved, lost people are there 
in our cities, in our communities, in our world. And we wonder why God is the long suffering. We wonder why God is patient. We say, why is God waiting? He is waiting until the very end. As the Bible says, when the son of man returns, will he even find faith on earth? He is waiting. He is giving humanity every opportunity that there is. And he will, he will wait until humanity says, Wait like wait till I see this God I don't believe in. I am going to let him know how much I don't know him and don't love him and don't want him. Because he says, when I come back, will I even find? Will I even find any faith on this planet? God is waiting. And he's waiting patiently. Peter says the active element to peace is make every effort. That's action. That's active. It means you work at it. Me, I work at this. We work at making every effort to be a man of peace. We work at being humble and being honest and being righteous with our fellow man, with our family, with our workplace. We work at this. We work at being honest and righteous and holy. We're made holy by the blood of Christ, but we're to live holy lives. And it's an active, it is an active part, an active effort on our part. Even if we cannot always accomplish it perfectly, and we can't. We live in this in between the birth of Christ, the return of Christ. You and I are people, we, we are people who still wait for the return of Christ. And we are to live as kingdom people today. We're looking for his return, but we're living for him today. We look ahead in hope to Christ's return. We don't do it passively. We work together and we allow the Holy Spirit to work in us as citizens of the kingdom. We serve and we work at God's pleasure today like Stephen look at his example being persecuted for standing in ways that God calls us to and there he is speaking of radical radical thoughts of forgiveness radical for his time radical for the religions and power of that day having patience toward others with the patience of God, that we would have the same desire that God has to, to, to love the lost and the desire that nobody would perish. This, this kingdom principle it, it looks like holiness, learning to align our entire lives with the with the with the, the leaning on the purpose and, and the will and the power of the Holy Spirit. Seeking his will and his goodness in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our world. Like peace, finding contentment and wholeness in our own lives. In our homes, in our communities. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. Becoming holistic spiritually, becoming one with the, with the Father, because we're one with the Lord, because we're one in the Spirit. <clears throat> we come before the Lord and we look for physical health. Yes, we pray for that. Mental health. Yes, we do spiritual health we we need a, a well-balanced holistic approach to walking and living in these days for the lord yes even as christians can you believe this we need to break the cycles of violence abuse we need to be in a place where we are helping our children or nieces nephews relatives brothers and sisters parents Instead of always walking through life saying, what is the best thing for me? 
as the question was asked in one story, who is my neighbor or what is best for my neighbor? Do I look out for my neighbor or do I only look out for myself? A holistic approach doesn't just look at us, it looks at the, the wholeness of our community, of our world. Why? Because Christ is returning. He's coming for a church without spot or wrinkle, washed in the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. He's coming for a church that are, that are followers, not for they are peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. He's looking for us to be living in a, in a holiness and a righteousness, to be living in peace to be a light that is set on a hill that cannot be hid. To be a shining star, an example to a, a bruised, hurting, broken world. And sometimes when we're not careful, we fall right into the alignment of the broken world. Instead of standing out, the Bible says, come out from among them, stand out from among them. Don't become one more broken reed in the, in, in, in the wave of, of, of those marshes. Instead, be the one who's healed and whole. It begins to stand up and lets the world see, yes, God is, God is different than this. As followers of Christ, we don't follow the same trappings of our world. We follow the very will of our God. So yes, peace. Let there be peace on earth. And let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, church. And let it begin with you. And it won't work unless we truly allow Jesus to impart into us the peace of God that passes all understanding. A peace that goes far deeper than a message on a card. But a peace that goes to the very center of the heart. That transforms and renews. All in Jesus' name. Lord, oh, would you help us? Oh, would you help us? To live for you and honor you and love you all the days of our life. Just like in Peter's day, there were those who, Lord, they, they saw that the, the upheaval of religion, the upheaval of governments, they saw the onslaught of advancements of, of violence against those who followed you, Jesus. And they began to wonder, where are you, Jesus? Lord, I pray that even as we, in our own world, we, we see the upheavals going on all around us. And sometimes, Lord, the church has found itself saying, Lord Jesus, where are you? And you're right there. Just as Peter had to write to the church and remind them that Jesus was right there. Lord, we need to be reminded that you are, you are right there in our lives. You said, and you meant it, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I will be with you to the very end of the age. Lord, I know that you are with us today. You are as close as our hearts. Lord, forgive us for those moments when we get so troubled. Forgive us, Lord, for those moments when our anxiety just takes over and just takes us right over the edge. Lord, that we can come back. And, and, and you rescue us. You rescue the perishing and you care for the dying. You bring us back into, into your fold. You, you draw us back to that place of peace. Lord, in this world, we, we need your peace. Your peace will remind us of your presence. Your peace will encourage us of your power. Your peace will put us back in the right priority. Would you help us today, I pray in Jesus' name. 
May we shine for you this Christmas season, even with all that's going on around us, that we could still shine for you, that we would be an encouragement to our families, that Jesus is the reason for the season. Yes. And that we would not, we would not run that quote through people sanctimoniously, but that we would we would run that quote through humbly that we could let people know, as for me and my house, we honor Jesus because Jesus is the Lord and Savior of our hearts. He's our peace. Who has broken down every wall. He is our peace. Thank you all in Jesus' name. And everyone said, <coughs> amen. 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 amen.